Kia ora whanau. Greetings once again from my family to yours and from Martin Road to Doolins Grove and everyone in between. Thanks for inviting me back. It's good to know I didn't put you off last time. Now, I did have a question about the whole accent thing. As far as I know, I don't have an accent. So where's all this crazy chatter coming from? Anyway, as before, it's a real privilege to join with you this afternoon in this way as we look at God's word together. Now, because of the time difference and when I needed to record this in order to get it to the tech-minded people, I'm going to make the assumption that yesterday's talk was about the example of generous giving that was demonstrated by the Macedonian churches, who, as we know, were going through a rough patch themselves anyway. But their example was used by Paul to spur on the Corinthians to display the same attitude of selfless generosity and contribute to the gift of money that would be distributed to the needy amongst the churches, especially in Jerusalem. And I found it interesting that Paul describes giving as a grace, right up there with faith and love. And so this morning's passage continues on, or maybe it's not morning for you, is it? It's afternoon. Continues on in a similar vein. Let's read it. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8, verses 8 to 15. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty might become sorry, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first, not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while, while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Now, as I said, I hope I'm not repeating what was said yesterday, but if I was cynical, I could say I'm sensing a bit of a hard sell here from Paul. At face value, it looks like he's, he's giving the Corinthians a case of the guilt so that there will be a decent amount of money for the poorer churches. However, I'm not a cynical person. I believe Paul acts with impeccable integrity, particularly when it comes to money. His baseline is always that he wants the best for all the churches that God has placed in his care, and he knows that the Corinthians are capable of giving without bankrupting themselves. In fact, it would be good for them. I believe that the reason he's pushing them so hard is clearly laid out in verse 8. I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. Uh, did your mother or father ever say when you were young, it's not fair to compare? Well, actually, it is fair to compare if you're being tested. I had a really interesting talk with a man at our church a while back, <clears throat> and, and we discussed that age-old question, why does God allow disasters and catastrophes to happen? Maybe we could ask, why does God allow COVID-19 to happen? My answer was that for God to intervene all the time would violate our free will. But my friend didn't accept that. He said, why, when the Garden of Eden was being planted, didn't God just leave out the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil? If it wasn't there, then we'd be spared from sin and all the sufferings that plagues us because of it. It got me really thinking about free will. And, and I do have a, an intention to write a sermon on it when I get a chance. But one of the key things I keep coming back to is that to test obedience or love, 
or faithfulness or just about anything, you have to provide two paths. If one option is all that's available to you, then, then you can't help but do the right thing. Everyone is brave uh, until they're placed in a dangerous situation. But if you want to know someone's heart on a matter, it becomes obvious when an alternative is placed before them. I remember setting up a bit of a test for my two kids, when they are much younger, of course. I put some lollies, or maybe you call them sweets, at eye height in the pantry. Then when they individually came up to me and asked for it, I said, no, no I haven't decided uh, which of you will get it, but at the moment you haven't earned it. Little did they know that I had decided that the one who was prepared to let the other person have it would be the winner. Unfortunately, neither child passed that test, so I ate it. Then there was that time when I set up a test for my wife, Wendy, but wait, wait, just kidding. I'm pretty sure it says in the Bible somewhere not to put your wife to the test. Very dangerous territory. But if you're operating under the overarching principle of free will, then you need to offer choice and you need to test. And that's exactly what God does. Adam and Eve could eat the fruit in front of them or move on to another tree. Abraham could absolutely refuse to sacrifice Isaac on the altar. It was even necessary for the Lord Jesus to be tested. In fact, maybe especially him. Matthew 4, 8 and 9. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. In all these situations and many others, God was able to see concrete proof of a person's true motivation by the course of, of action they chose under testing. That raises the obvious question, I think, are we still being tested today? Do some of the ups and downs of life have more significance than we know? Does it make you wonder if this COVID-19 crisis is used by God to test us? Take away our daily routine and lifestyle, our, our pleasures and distractions, and how do we respond? Could the lockdown be a test to reveal if we are focused on ourselves or on giving to others? And as we know, giving doesn't always involve money. It, it could mean a gift of time, maybe a phone call or email or being the designated shopper for somebody. And I actually encourage to see the innovative ways Christians are spreading the good news during this time. I also feel people are taking God a bit more seriously when they see everything they know and the freedoms they take for granted so easily stripped away. My prayer is that, like a savvy politician, we won't waste a good crisis that with God's help, we can get the message of hope out there at a time when people are, are already searching for answers. It's been said that tests are not for the sake of the teacher, but for the benefit of the student. In other words, teachers don't ask test questions because they need to know the answers. They ask questions because, of, because the students need to know the answers. And in the same way, I think God ordains tests for us, not for his sake, but for ours. And there are maybe three different types of tests described in the Bible. Firstly, diagnostic tests. And just like a medical scan might show how healthy our body is, God tests us to reveal our spiritual condition. The example is Israel in the wilderness, Deuteronomy 8.2. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Their 40-year test in the wilderness revealed just how easily the Israelites could forget about God who, who brought them out of Egypt. And in the same way, our tests may reveal just how easily under stress we fall back into old patterns of behavior, such as pride or anger. 
God tells us in James 1.13 that he never tempts us to sin. There's a world of difference between those two words, tempt or test. We can rest assured that then that the, uh, the tests we face are not designed to lead us to sin. Rather, they reveal our heart, not just to God, but actually to ourselves as well. The second type of test is an educational test. When storms blew up on the Sea of Galilee in Matthew 8, the disciples faced an educational test of their faith. In this case, their eyes were focused on the waves and the wind, but they, they failed to comprehend that they were being tested. They forgot who was in the boat with them. So they failed that test. Jesus said, why are you afraid, O oh, you of little faith? But they learned from it. It was educational, and they were better prepared the next time the unexpected struck. I think we often fail as well. But God in his grace can even use failure to teach us to rely more on him and less on our own strength. Now, I'd like to jump to the other part of our passage today, which deals with equality. Paul claims that equality is the goal, verse 14. Maybe in the microcosm of the first century church, there was a bit more equality. We read about the rich selling property to support the poor. But it makes me question, is this how our world works? Has the world ever been fair and equal? And I think back to immediately after the Tower of Babel, some groups such as uh, the Babylonians or Egyptians began to build complex societies, while others lived a stone-aged existence in a cave. There's always been the haves and the have-nots. And don't we see an increasing gap between rich and poor? A 2010 study showed the top 20% of American society actually controls 85% of the wealth. And the bottom 40%, which represents about 120 million Americans, control only 0.3%. And this is probably true of most Western countries. But I think we understand that God could care less about how much money we have. But he is very interested in how tight our grip on it is. I had a friend when I was in my 20s. He wasn't a Christian, but he just put me to shame time and time again with his generosity. He would literally give you the shirt off his back. And looking back, I realized his hands were open while I grasped onto things with a tight grip. I wish I could have passed that test, but I know I failed it. Hopefully I've since learned to be more giving. If it bothers you that the top 20% own everything, then consider that even the lowest, the poorest 5% of Americans are still wealthier than almost 70% of the world population. And some of you who have been overseas have seen this with your own eyes. Life may not be fair, but most of us live a very blessed existence. We are materially rich, but I think the spiritual test is how tightly do we grasp onto our wealth? How open are our hands? So I guess Paul is talking about financial equality in the passage today. What I think he's saying is that there is a responsibility to help those less fortunate because there may come a day when the shoe is on the other foot. But as a general principle, the only time we can expect equality is when we are found in the Lord Jesus. In him, we are considered equal in God's sight. Galatians 3, 26 to 28. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now that's true equality, isn't it? And, and that leads us to the third type of testing, which is a test of certification. Sometimes tests are necessary to demonstrate 
<clears throat> that a candidate is certified in a particular field. We take a driving test to get a license. There are professional licensing exams to be qualified to do a particular job. In all those cases, standards are set, questions are asked, and the answers are evaluated by experts who determine whether candidates pass or fail. We know God has the desire that no one should perish. However, a day is coming when he will test our hearts and determine whether we are righteous or wicked. As David said in Psalm 7, 9, O let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God. If it was based on what we're capable of, capable of forget it. The test of righteousness would be impossible for us to pass. But in Christ, in Christ we pass the qualification test with flying colours. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 uh, Life's strange at the moment, isn't it? Ron said he's turning into a slug at home. But we can be encouraged, right? What a wonderful saviour we have. What a fantastic future we have. How blessed we are to be in Christ. And with God's help, may those blessings spill over to those around us, particularly those in need. Thanks again for the opportunity to fellowship with you. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday and blessings to you and everyone in your bubbles. Yeah.